Cheers, everyone, and welcome to the Heath Bar. I'm your host, Heath Johnson. Each week, I sit down with an artist, creator, or leader who lives or passes through the Black Hills area, kick back a few drinks, and chat about their story. There's some incredible people that surround us, and this is your chance to get to know more about them. From singer-songwriters, film producers, craft brewers, community leaders, and more, the Heath Bar serves up a healthy selection of chats on tap. You can find this and past episodes on iTunes Podcasts and Spotify as well. Just subscribe in the app and you'll know right when your conversation is ready for you. There's also blog posts about the episodes, links to find more info on the guests, merch, and my public schedule as well at heathbaronline.com. And get social with the Heath Bar. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram with at heathbaronline, or you can hunt me down on Twitter with just my name, at heathjohnson. And for all you regulars and want to be regulars, you can now donate to the podcast and keep this project going, getting to know all the badass people that make up our area around here. You can do so at heathbaronline.com. Just click on the donate button and it'll take you to your page where you can toss in whatever it is you're able to do to help keep this project going and keep getting to know some interesting people from around our area. Speaking of which, Matt Melanson is here this week. Matt and I have known each other for the better part of the past decade and have become incredibly solid friends. Uh, We first met years ago by happenstance in a pub on Easter, which, if you ask me, is a surefire way to meet the best people. He always seems to have a story or seven that he would like to share with you, and from what I can tell right now, they all seem to be true. He's had quite a lot of journeys and has worn many hats in his life, but he currently is the sales rep for Crow Peak Brewery in Spearfish, South Dakota. He's one of my favorite people just to sit and talk with without realizing that hours have passed me by. And I'm really pleased that I'm able to bring you this episode of the Heath Bar. So hello world, here's Matt Melanson. Welcome to the Heath Bar, where the conversations are always on tap. Oh yeah, that's good. That's great. Does the listening world know we have two dopey full-size dogs down here that who who may at any point raise hell and start wrestling? Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna hear them <clears throat> up and down the stairs a few times. But mm-hmm. we're dog lovers and dog owners, and anyone that isn't is sad. Is sad. Between the two of them, I think we've got about 160 or 170 pounds in, in dog. And not a brain cell between them. <laughs> not when they're together. <laughs> and you know somebody that listens to this is going to be like, Wow, well, my God, I got a St. Bernard who weighs 170 pounds by himself. It's not about you, dude. It's yeah, about back, these dogs. Oh, here, here it is. Here it is, Matt. What? I got the extraordinary... Hey, this is a big day for you on Untapped. You just checked in your thousandth beer. My thousandth unique beer. Wicked. That's a big deal, man. And it was Toppling Goliath Golden Nugget. Mmm. Heath Bar, now accepting sponsorships. (laughs) From here until eternity. (laughs) Yes. Especially if it involves free, great beer. Give me a call. I'll cut you a deal. You can find me. You can find me. Uh... Yeah, dude, good pick. This is really good. I yeah. I like it. Everything I've had by this brewery is outstanding. Well, and you have a history of craft beer. It's, I think when I've, that's all I've known you as is a craft beer, massive craft beer connoisseur, hmm. if that's such a thing. Um, do, you, do you ever sit down and go, okay, do I have a favorite craft beer? Or is it just like you... It's what you do. You like craft beers, and to pick one would, would like be impossible. Probably, oh boy, probably a little bit of each because I, I just love good beer across the board, regardless of the style. I was in Prague, um, Czech Republic, about a year year and a half ago, um, and I'm not usually much of a light beer drinker, but in Prague, that's the birth pl- birthplace of the Pilsner. Uh, that's that's where that style of beer was born. 
Ah, I don't know if I realize that. And you will Prague. never have such a great light beer as what you will drink in Prague with their with their pilsners, their traditional pilsners. I mean, it's 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 the holy grail of light beers. Their beer their their beers are amazing. And uh, and side note, the nice thing about traveling in Central Europe, it's very cheap. You get over to Prague, you can get a liter of beer. They don't serve pints; they serve liters. <laughs> There's no 16 ounces garbage, bro. Listen here, sweetheart. Yeah, you get a <laughs> mug. It's the size of your face. Oh, my gosh. And it boils out to about literally $2 American. You've got to be kidding me. No, per pint. We, we, were, at the, we were at Prague Castle, and uh, I was with my, some of my very best friends, um, Peanut, who mm-hmm. you've met. Yeah. Who some people call him Steven, but his real name's Peanut. And our friend Aaron Benson and his wonderful girlfriend Lisa and our friend Marine, and we went to Prague Castle and we ordered beers at lunch and the beer was three fifty and without thinking I went oh wow definite tourist prices here in the castle and Peanut looks at me and he says dude you paid three dollars and fifty cents for a liter of world class beer <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> shut your mouth Just and shut drink up it. and enjoy oh my gosh. Yeah, the uh, uh, when I first started getting into craft beer, God, this is years ago now. I remember the first one I saw that was like twelve dollars for like ten ounces, but it was like a twelve percent, sure, like thick. And sure. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, but it's America. We like to price things well, and you get what you pay for too. That's true. You know, so like back to back to your original question. I mean. I, I state that story just because most of the time I don't go looking for for light beers. I like I like porters, I like stouts, I like IPAs, and you know IPAs might be light in color, but mm-hmm. but the, the taste certainly isn't light because of the bite of the hop, and a lot of people are scared of that. So I could definitely point a few beers that are among my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if if somebody's ever had you know, and there's a lot of hype around this beer. Pliny the Elder, it's it's a phenomenal double IPA yeah. out of Russian River Brewing, and I tell you what, it lives up to the hype. There's no way around it. You know, it's it's just a phenomenal beer. It's that's one I haven't had yet. That is, I've had the younger. You have? I believe so. Because the well, younger, maybe I'm getting them confused. Because the younger is even harder to find. The younger is a triple IPA that's just filthy. Oh, maybe I so haven't good. had that. Maybe I'm getting it confused. Hmm. I don't think I've had the Elder though. It's outstanding. Yeah, like it's it's. There's a bar in Denver, um, Falling Rock Tap House, that I is, uh, and I mean I could, I could totally be getting this wrong because I get a lot of things wrong in life. But Wait. we were there. We went there when we were in Colorado. A few yes, back. we did. I did yes. have the Elder when we went and saw Blackberry Smoke. I took you there. That's yes, you have right. had plenty of the Elder. Yes, and it's an astounding uh, IPA. I mean, cut me a little bit of slack. There's a lot I don't remember of that. Night. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of that trip that we don't right. remember. That's right. I, oh yeah. man, that was a good time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, like, I can point to that, uh, or, or or even say like Sierra Nevada is by far one of my favorite breweries because they're a brewery that's been doing it for. Gosh, 27 years, 28 years. Mm. They made a way for guys like me. I have a full-time job in the craft brew industry. I, I, I'm the, the beer rep for a local brewery here in town, Crow Peak Brewery. Without guys like, you know, people can talk talk trash on Sam Adams all they want. Mm-hmm. Without Sam Adams, guys like me wouldn't have a job. Yeah, that's true. That's the damn truth. And they still make quality beer. It might not be completely up your alley. It's maybe a little lighter than what you like. It not, might not be... A full bone, balls out, freaking their market ridiculous. reach that they're trying to go for is that, though. Exactly, it's, it's and they do a the, good job. Yeah. You know, so I look at Sierra Nevada, and this time of year, you know, we're recording this in January, and every year, uh, just before Christmas, Sierra Nevada releases their Fresh Hop IPA, the Celebration Ale. And it is, to me, I, I, I don't... And, of course, everybody has different tastes. Mm-hmm. You've got, you know, your uppers and downers with every people. They, they like things. They don't like things. There's not a thing in that beer I would change. It's perfect. It's a phenomenal IPA. Among all, you know, and there's other breweries with big seasonal releases mm-hmm. that they only release one day. And right, right. You've got to get in line a year before to get a keg of it. 
at the end of the day, you can have all of them, and I'll take Celebration Ale because it's just a solid IPA, and it's so damn tasty, and it's just so well done. So you get a, a brewery like Sierra Nevada, who's huge, and they have their brewery still in Northern California, and they have one in, in, in North Carolina, and they've compromised nothing. Yeah. Their beers are still top notch. To me, the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is the standard for American pale ales. They wrote the book. Yeah, it's a pretty, that's solid. Everybody else comes in far second. You know, yeah. there's some great American pale ales, mm-hmm. but they set the standard. It's a phenomenal beer. Uh, Celebration is one of my, it's one of my go-tos this time of year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's you can't easy, go wrong. you go in, you grab it, you're like, I know I'm going to like this. And yeah. I bring, I'll bring it to like a holiday party with, with my family and everything like that. And it's a good way to gauge on um, who I like and who I don't in my family. And who, <laughs> who wants to have exactly. one of those and who, who goes for the bush light. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> I was in Florida about two years ago. I was down there for a couple of weeks with, with some of my very best friends, Daniel and Jenny Larkin, and their wonderful children. Um, and the, the grocery store chain down south is called Publix. And... I, I don't know if just because they run so much so much uh, product and they have such – anyway, dude, they're selling like 12 packs of Celebration Ale for like $11. What the heck? $10. I mean, stupid. Oh, my gosh. So me and Daniel, I was down there for the three or four weeks. We'd go to the store twice a week and buy two 12-packs. That's all we were drinking <laughs> for like – I mean, you'd think you'd get worn out on that beer, and all I did was – because then it's gone. It's yeah. gone for a year. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, you yeah. know, and then it's gone. You, you drink it, you, you love it for a month, and then you go, okay, okay sweetheart, I'll, I'll see you next year. I'll miss you. Back to the I, ocean. I love you. I'll wait till you come ashore again. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and so we're just down there hand over fist buying just a stupid amount of celebration ale because it's just that wonderful of yeah. beer, you know. But yeah. but yeah, I mean, beer as a whole, I just love craft beer, and... You know, of course, I don't know how much we'll get into this today, but you and I have talked a lot about about international things and about the U.S. and, mm-hmm. and where we stand as a nation and where we are. One of the things that I'm very, very proud of as American is we're absolutely, and, and no one will ever convince me any different of this, the United States of America is leading the charge, and we are the tip of the spear. We are the top of the game for beer. Hmm. And it's not the crap that you see on the commercials. Yeah. It's not the garbage that puts America on their cans. Side note, that's not America. They're owned by a Belgian company. Um, <laughs> but the microbreweries in the... There's 7,000 microbreweries in this country. Oh, I didn't realize there was that many. That, that was the updated number from the, wow. the Brewers Association of America. And... We are leading, I mean, we're going bananas with hops and with oatmeal and with cocoa and with uh, with fresh coconut and lime. And we're making margarita beers. I had a beer out of uh, Kansas City, this guy named Rodney Beagle, who will be listening to this. And he's a brewer at a place called Colony KC, which sadly the brewery side is going out of business. But this dude's going to land on his feet because he does phenomenal, phenomenal beer. Mm-hmm. And he brewed a beer to specifically pair... With guacamole. What? And when I read it on paper, I was like, dude, you're out of your mind. This is going to taste like garbage. And he sent me a a half growler of it, and it was out of this world fantastic. He took a Mexican-style light lager. Mm -hmm. He put sea salt, some lime, and some spices, just enough spices. Dude, it was outstanding. Absolutely fantastic beer. Nobody else is doing that. Nobody else in any part of the world is doing that. That is true. I mean, when you think of... Like all the different types of craft beer that you find when you walk into any given brewery or any tap house or anything. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. you know, independent ale house and all the different stuff they bring in um, from all these different places. And there's tons of places like that that just have yeah. craft beer. Uh, the variety and the willingness to get creative is definitely there. Oh, absolutely. And I don't know, I don't know if I see that. Of course, I guess I don't really pay that much attention overseas, you know, but. Uh, I don't know if I see that other than here. To that right. degree, I guess. I mean, Guinness is doing a bunch of different stuff now. Sure. I wish they wouldn't. I'm like, it's right. You already have the best. <laughs> like, right. Leave it alone. Just leave it be. <laughs> see, I even know people in the craft beer world who like who kind of like crap on Guinness a little bit, and they're like, well, it's not even that great of a stout. 
and I want to look at him and go, oh, yeah, D- do you have a beer that's been being made for 300 years? Right. <laughs> it is a great beer, and it's the most recognized brand worldwide. Yep. Guinness is. Yep. They make a damn good stout. On top of it, they make a nice full-bodied stout that's, what, 4.5% alcohol? Yeah. They yeah, keep it light. Oh, dude, you can drink four or five of them. Yes. And you're good. And I it, say four or five. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> like That's a standard <laughs> <laughs> That's just what you should do. That's just how you do, <laughs> idiots. <laughs> and it, same thing with same thing. Going back to Sierra Nevada and and Sam Adams, without Guinness, we wouldn't have the stouts that we have today. Yeah. Because back in the day, they could have made an easy light beer. No, they made a big, robust stout that's yeah. creamy, tasty, easy going. And without it. A lot of us, you wouldn't have this. I guarantee to you, you would not have the variety of stouts you have today. Well, and there's a lot of mythology around the story of Guinness. I mean, oh, maybe sure. just, I mean, something's been around that long. Stories creep up out of nowhere about it, you know. And then, then you watch it, and when, when it all settles, and then you see they, th- their marketing is brilliant. Oh, my goodness. They even have, like, this is how you do, how you drink a Guinness right, how you pour it mm-hmm. right, and that. So then it becomes like this almost mythical creature that you have to, right. like, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Oh, absolutely. You know, versus, you know, any other beer out there is I just pour it in a glass. You know, right. You know, it's not, it's the same with every beer, but the way they present it, it just, it makes you think you're dealing with magic, man. Well, and like you and I have <laughs> both been, we've both been to Ireland, yeah. separate trips, yeah. and hopefully we'll get one together soon. And we've both been to the Guinness Storehouse. You, you you look at that whole level in the storehouse that's all dedicated to their old marketing. Oh, dude, and, it's and so great. It's incredible, and it's brilliant because in the 1930s, they were putting ads out in the newspapers that Guinness was good for, like, literally good for your health. They had doctor's notes saying that Guinness can help cure the common cold. Good for health. Yeah, good, good for, for your strength. health. I mean, it's, <laughs> God, it's brilliant. How do you beat that? I, and to a certain degree... I've always felt better when I've been sick and had a had a Guinness. Oh, our kid, absolutely. I've never not felt good. I've never not had a good time <laughs> drinking Guinness. No. Nope. Side note: when when uh, when my first trip to Ireland was again with my buddy Peanut, who is gonna be on this show one day. One day. Probably on his own, or probably in a oh, roundabout. We'll, we'll do we'll do a three, a th- all three of us. Uh, yeah, that'll be a blast. Or or we'll do just a round table with uh, with with Daniel, Peanut, you and me, oh, a couple other great. characters. Yeah. Um, the first time we were in Ireland, I went with I went with Peanut, and uh, I forget we 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 met we I flew into Shannon. And he, he and his mom were already there. They were on a little family deal, and uh, from Shannon we went to Cliffs of Moore and Galway, and I think it was I think it was a pub in Galway, and we walked in, and the bartender you know he asked us how we're doing, we're like oh good hey how are you, and you know he heard our American accents, and he points to the Budweiser tap, he's like ah oh, you boys want a beer you know we've got Budweiser on tap. And I'm pretty mouthy, and I try to keep my – I try to run my tact filter as much as I can. Yeah. So does Peanut, but his tact filter, he it's not the, so much that he can't. He just doesn't want to. <laughs> he, like, avoids it. Oh, absolutely, cause. and it's beautiful. And so this, this bartender, you know, fucking Seamus McGee is asking us if we want a Budweiser, and Peanut goes, are you fucking kidding me? I <laughs> left America to get away from that goddamn beer. Give me a Guinness. <laughs> Just no old bard. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I can bar- picture it. Oh, absolutely. I can picture it. The Hobbit in Ireland. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's great. Throwing out, yeah. Well, and they've got. Uh, I mean, it, part of it too in Ireland is the whole island itself has mythology built into. Oh it. my goodness! It's in yeah, its ludicrous. Like even when I was, um, I went through the Smithwick Brewery while I was there also. So did I. And yeah. that's a cool brewery too. With the whole. Is that in Kilkenny or Killarney? Um, just south of Dublin, so I think it's Kilkenny. South and west, I think it's Kilkenny. Yep, it's yeah. Kilkenny. Um, but they've got the whole, like, just a story of the monks yes. brewing their beer. And it's, yes. it's right, um, this was right after we toured, or we didn't, didn't tour, but we walked past the Black Abbey. Mm, and, uh, sure. And just, first off, can you think of a better name for an abbey other than the right. Black Abbey? Espe- especially for all the things that the Catholic Church put people through. <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, but it was right by the right by the creek that flew th- that flowed through the town, and yeah. that's where they would get their water. And so they kind of exactly kinda through all the story and everything like that. But we go around the corner, and uh, we find this this pub 
that you wouldn't even know it's a pub except there's a Guinness sign out. So you, we walk in and it's this long uh, hallway that then turns right into this bar in like the far back side of this mm. building. And we walk in and it's noon. Oh, yeah. And there are five older dudes in there that are, you know, <laughs> they've been there for a few hours already. <laughs> like they, were, they were having a great time. Uh, we got photos with them. They were a blast. We chatted with them, talked with them. and um, But even with, like, so as much as, as Guinness has that mythology, like, anywhere you go, like, the way that they talk about the stories of their beer um, gives it that feel. And craft brewery in America, when you, when you really get into it, is a lot of the same way. Absolutely. Like, the story of how certain breweries popped up and how they came to be. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's... It's it's incredible to hear, and especially mm-hmm. when seven thousand now. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day that you know here in Spearfish we've got three breweries now. Yeah, in a town of twelve thousand people. In a town of twelve thousand people, and I don't think I've gone by a single one of them on any given night, just driven past and not seen all of them. Decent crowds. Yeah, doing well. Full, like doing, doing very well. well. Yes. Um, so it's not like there's one that's hurting or anything like that. Right. And, and when you uh, we were comparing that to uh, to Rapid City that has I think five now. Mm-hmm. So when you think about that per capita spearfish, right? <laughs> we just really like our we beer. Have, we have three and we have twelve thousand people. Rapid City has five and it has what sixty five to seventy thousand something people? like that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's also just purely not as cool as spearfish. <laughs> I mean, there's no way. <laughs> Greatest, greatest town up. in the state. Can't measure up. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that to, to uh, Tom and Jesse next time I see him. Well, hey, absolutely. Matt has something to say to you guys. <laughs> oh, it's, it's nothing they haven't heard before. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, that's the beauty of the craft beer community in, in the United States too, is I've, I've traveled around a lot all over this country and, and some around the world. I mm-hmm. want to certainly do more, but it, it is very rare. To find someone in the craft beer community who's an asshole. It's yeah. very rare. People are so – this is one of the few industries, and this is the beauty and the purity of it. It's one of the very few industries. I mean, if you owned a successful restaurant, would you go to the guy across the street and be like, yo, dude, let me tell you what I'm doing with my raspberry reduction sauce that I put over my pork chop? No. Or even further, would you would you go to some guy that you know wants to start a restaurant and then help them do it? Right, exactly. You know what I mean? But that's what the craft beer community does, yeah. and that's one of the things that I, I just I I uh, respect so much about Crow Peak Brewing and Spearfish. I mean, dude, we've helped countless breweries. Come back to the days where I was a, a, a an assistant brewer. You know, Jeff would walk back and be like, "Hey, this is such and such from." You know, they're starting a brewery in Leed. They, I'm going to have them brew with you today. Show them the ropes. They, they want to see our system and how we do things. Awesome. Excellent. That's yeah. great. Or, you know, there was a small brewery that, that unfortunately isn't around anymore down in Custer, and he didn't have a keg cleaning machine. So he would, about once a month, bring a pickup load of kegs to Crow Peak and spend the day cleaning his kegs on our machine. And Jeff never charged him a dime. God, that's amazing. He didn't charge him for the fluids, for the clean, nothing. It's like, no, man, let's grow this together. We've And we've even we've even had some some things where we've screwed up and our yeast has gone bad. And we call the guys at the knuckle. We go, holy crap, dude, we're in a pickle. We need some yeast right now. Yeah, come get it. Yeah. Come get it. Yeah. Hey, we're, uh, you know, sick and twisted down in, in, uh, in Hill City. Uh, there's been a hard time over the past six months of getting aluminum because of our current administration's um, tariffs and stuff. Tariffs yeah. on Chinese aluminum. So yeah. that is side note why you didn't see some of our um, seasonals in cans this year. We couldn't get cans because there's a damn tariff. Mm. You know, because build the wall, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> China. <laughs> um, so. We'll get a few more deep and <laughs> this circle could get, back. This could really get off the rails. <laughs> so we run out of lids. So Jeff, he calls Rob down at Sick and Twist. He's like, hey, man, how are you guys sitting on lids? We need to can our seasonal Mjolnir, and, and we're low. We can't get any more. Everybody's behind because of the tariff. And Rob goes, I've got plenty. Come get them. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I can get you enough sleeves to get you guys through. That's the beauty of it. There's no other industry that does this. I mean, when we some of my favorite events are some of the beer fests. Because, dude, it is shenanigans top to bottom, oh, and it yeah. never stops. Yeah. You go home, and you're searching your truck 
for stickers from other breweries all over the place, all over your camper, all over your gear, everything. And you did the same thing, you yeah. know, and, and, and it's all in good fun. Everybody leaves and we have a great time. The majority of the time we get done with a beer fest in whatever city we are and we go, hey, go drop off your stuff at the hotel and let's meet, you know, if it's in Sioux Falls, you go, dude, let's meet back at Woodgrain Brewing or Remedy Brewing. Yeah. And let's, you know. Let's shut down the bar tonight. Let's have a good time. Let's all hang out and buy each other beers and yeah. just chat about the business or chat about life, chat about nothing, whatever. You know, it's it's such it's a beautiful business. I've you know the breweries in Colorado are some of the greatest I've known of, not only for quality, but you walk into a brewery in Colorado and go, hey, you know, I, you know, I, I work for this tiny little brewery up in South Dakota, and they go, awesome man, first rounds on us. Yeah. Oh, cool. You know, you walk in with a six pack. Well, we went like, down to when we were down there. We went to us. Uh, was it? Um, it was true. True brewery. Yeah. Yep. And we brought you brought the uh, a six pack uh, of our IPA, IPA and and uh, we walked in, gave him a six pack, and chatted with them for a bit, and and yeah, yeah. I don't he's think, like, I don't no, think we paid for a beer. No, he's like, yeah. you're not getting charged for anything. And he was a cool dude too. Yeah. Man. Cool, mouthy. <laughs> dude, do you loud. remember the dude that came in with those two girls right after when we were sitting there? The, yeah. He's like looking. So so true brewing. Um, it's fairly small. Like you walk into the tap. Uh, maybe on, maybe they're bigger, but their tap house was yeah on Broadway in Denver. Phenomenal brewery. Yeah, great brewery. Like, um, their bathroom has employees must carve Slayer into arm before we're returning to, to work. work. So great. I got the owner to give me that uh, a copy of that. Oh, sticker. sweet, it's brilliant. Dude. Um. But yeah, this guy walked in with, with two girls, and they were pretty young. I would imagine young 22 ish, yeah, yeah. 23 ish. And uh, they walk <laughs> in, and uh, everything is behind the brewer or behind the bartender. Um, has It lists the name of the beer, what it is IPA, brown, you know, porter, <laughs> right. blah, blah, that. And <laughs> dude, I'll never forget it. The, the guy goes, Hey, you got anything? Uh, you got anything like brown? Yeah. <laughs> and the bartender looked at him and goes, "Yeah, dude, the one that says brown, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> right behind me." <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't subtle about it. He's no. like, "Oh, you, are you kidding me, man? It's right there." Yeah. And the two girls that were with him, I remember one of them who looked exceptionally young. She's like. Oh, can I sample your Saison? And he goes, Oh, can I sample your ID? <laughs> <laughs> so great. Yeah, no, there there is definitely a uh, camaraderie with craft Absolutely. brewers that it's you you don't find to that level. I don't know if you if if you can in any other industry. No. Like in music, there's camaraderie with it. But there's still a little bit of a level of competition. Sure. Like, uh, you sure. know, when you're uh, trying to trying to book gigs and trying to survive on it and everything like that, because yeah. it's it's I don't know if it's just felt like, well, if, if they get a gig, I don't get that gig. And right. I have to I'm go, missing out. You know, right. and with, with craft beer, it's not the same feel by no. any means. No. Um Yeah, dude. And uh I'll I'll be a craft drink beer drinker probably until the day I die. Um, well, and that's another big thing for me is, is, is uh, you know, so many pe- – Americans have been duped in so many ways. Um, Excuse me. By corporate BS, you mm-hmm. know, all the chains, all this. Listen, if you're going to a chain for dinner, trust me, I've worked in the service industry off and on for over 20 years. I've been a cook. I've been a bartender. I've been a waiter. If you're, if you're eating dinner at any chain, just know this – all the sauces and the mixes that went into your meal came from a bag. <laughs> they came from a bag or they came from a can. They weren't mixed. For, you know, we got a place here in town, Killian's. I worked for two years. The majority of the, the salad dressings are, are made by hand. Yeah. You know, there might be a base of buttermilk ranch, but they spice it up in their own way and they make it some. The burgers are hand patty, right? Mm-hmm. And so – People have been duped by this domestic beer thing and brewed in the high mountain waters of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> and that's cool, but check those recipes because the majority of your of your grain bill is rice. You know why? Because it's cheap and it's filler. Yeah. And that's garbage. That's not beer. So if you want to drink domestic, if you want to sow into your local community, if you want to drink American, if you want to sow into American... Find your local co- local craft brewery. And yeah, it might cost you $2 more a pint, but you know where that money goes? Right back into your community. Yeah. It goes into some guy's pocket who's paying taxes to make your town better. 
Yeah, your neighbor, your you know, right. Yeah, you know, dump dump the corporate BS and and support the little guy. Well, and that's the thing too. There, there's a big, I think there's a big idea out floating around out there that all craft beer is like super heavy and super mm-hmm. alcoholic, you know, and it's like you know. 5.5s and above and everything. And that's sure. not the case by no. any means. Now, granted, there is a lot of that because, right. like you said earlier, people like to experiment. Yep. And we like to yep. try new things and see see what we can concoct. But there's still a level of there where you can go get a light craft beer. And it's outstanding. Yeah. It's, it's a It's going to be beer. way better than what you get anywhere else. Um, so, uh, you know, we made, we, made, <laughs> we made fun of McGinnis. But the Rush Enforcer Ale from, yeah. Crab, from, Crab, from Crow Peak, um, that's a light, light beer. Yeah. As far I, what I would consider a light beer. Oh, very you light. Know, it's, it's not, but it's good. Yeah, it's so it's great. good. Dude, yeah. it's, a, it's a great go-to. Absolutely. I want to drink this. I want to taste this. But um, yeah, yeah, man, it's, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I, uh, do you, so are IPAs kind of your, other than Celebration Ale, is that your go-to? I, you dig IPAs more than anything else? Probably. I kind of went through, <clears throat> so when I, when I first learned what was good beer, I moved to Nashville in 1999, I want to say, and I was like like newly 21. I'm very old. I'm 41. Um, you're, for, you're over 40. Oh, yeah, dude. I turned 41 I know, in October. I this. I'm dying soon. I'll be 35 in a few weeks, man. Oh, you're a pup. What's it like? It's What's awful. It like? Your body starts to hurt. <laughs> My body hurts now. You wake up and randomly... <laughs> What did I see? I saw a meme. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Meme or meme that said, uh, welcome to your 40s. If you do not have an ailment, one will be handed out to you shortly. Just give it to and that's right spot away. on. Oh, In man. the last year, I've had to change my whole diet because my body was like, Meh, I hate this Dude, now. I've gotten to the point where if, if I don't actively like, work out, like my metabolism... Like my lower back starts to hurt. <laughs> it just starts building around it's your like, belly. Hey man, work off some of that because right. I'm straining it back here. What's happening, fat boy? <laughs> oh my gosh! But then I'll do like a couple weeks of running and stuff, and I'm like, oh man, I feel way better. But yeah, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, so I, yeah, so I moved to Nashville in like '99, and I, I knew nothing about beer. I was 21. All I knew was what every other American knows at that age: Budweiser and this and that and all that. You well, know, at least you waited to twenty-one to drink. Like I didn't like say a good, I waited like a good 21. boy, man. <laughs> <laughs> My mom's listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, a buddy of mine, my my good friend, my old friend Casey Jones, he said, "Hey, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to this this beer thing, you know, little by little here." Uh, and he gave me my first pint of Guinness. Bought me my first kind of pint mm-hmm. of Guinness, and I was like, "Holy crap! What is this? This is outstanding! Mm-hmm. It's like a pork chop in a bottle. I'm, yeah. I'm chewing it. This mm-hmm. is great." And then I just built from there. And, and then a few years later, I, I ended up living um, in in Philadelphia, in Northeast Philly. And my buddy John Flagler, who again, another guy to this day, one of my very, very closest friends, one of the greatest guys you could ever know, um, he bartended at a pub called the Gray Lodge Pub in Northeast Philly. It's on, on uh, um, just off the boulevard for people who might be listening to this in Philadelphia by some chance. Um, phenomenal pub. This is a guy who has supporting, been supporting the owner, Mike Scotes. He's been supporting craft brew, craft beer for like 25 years. Jeez. So like he was one of the first guys in that area to put Dogfish Head on tap. Oh, dude. To put Victory on tap, Harpoon. Uh, Dock Street, all these amazing East Coast breweries. So now, when they have specialty beers, when they have ultra specialties, if there's something they make seven barrels of, he's the guy that gets a call. It's like, hey, dude, you want a keg of this? Hey, man. He does firkins, which for out there in the beer world, if you know what a firkin is, a firkin is old, very old school beer. It's only naturally carbonated by yeast. So for most Americans, we think it tastes flat, but that's, that's old school cellar beer. And it's, it's pumped off a beer engine <clears throat> and you can use a ton of, uh, adjunct flavors. You can, you know, you throw all fr- sorts of fruits or spices and herbs in there. So he'll do a Friday the 14th <laughs> for every Friday the 13th that happens in the, in the, in, on the calendar. Uh-huh. And he'll kick 26 of these each time. Oh my goodness. That's how much that's how craft centric this bar is. Yeah. So that bar t- 
taught me so much because I went in there thinking I knew kind of what good beer was. And my buddy John Flagler was like, dude, you need to try this. 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 And all the bartenders knew me. And since, since Johnny was a buddy of mine and, and my uncle Doug, who's a wonderful man, he was a police officer in Philly for 42 years. And, and he was kind of from around that area. You know, those old East Coast cities, they still go off neighborhoods. Yeah, you yeah, know. absolutely. So I roll in with a red beard and pale skin, so instantly they think I'm a, you know, Irish Catholic like everybody else in the damn area. <laughs> <laughs> and since I'm buddies with John and my, my cousin Bax at the time was a bartender, they just accept, accepted me as one of their own, which is wonderful because I still have great friends out there. And that's where I really discovered the beauty of craft beer was in Philadelphia because obviously it was, you know, years ahead of this area. Right, right, you know, you know the the Dakotas and 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 Wyoming, Montana, Minnesota are you know they're playing some catch up. They're doing good, yeah, but they're playing some catch up. But that's where I really fell in love with craft beer. That's where I was having beers from Dogfish Head and Lancaster Brewing and Trogues and Victory and um, Allagash out of Maine, which is makes just some stupid good beer. And that's where I you know it's kind of like where I got my beer education. Um, well, and when you think of like, there's a lot of laws that surprise me about craft beer still. Oh, absolutely. It, it, it's ridiculous. Like, like um, there's a lot of the, a lot of the rules in Montana and stuff with how their craft beer works. And I'm like, I wait, what? Montana? I was talking to a buddy of mine who lives up there and he was like, oh yeah, you know, you can only have a couple of tap outs when you, you know, you just go to the bar, you know, it's the same as here. I was like, no. Yeah. He goes, what? I said, no, that's no. not normal, man. Like, no. That's not how it works everywhere yeah. else. You For can... people who don't know, in Montana, legally, you're only allowed to have 48 ounces of craft beer a day. A day. Anyway. Montana has craft beer laws, has, has alcohol laws, that you would think were in, like, friggin' southern Alabama. The <laughs> Bible Belt. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's like, like they give you a wristband, and for every beer, they give you a punch. So when you get to four, you're done. And they're only allowed to be open from four to eight, unless they have a food license. And that's just the craft beer. So then just you can go beer. get right. So you can have four else. beers at a craft brewery, walk a block down or across the street to a liquor bar and get housed <laughs> off freaking beam and coke. <laughs> but God forbid you have more craft yeah. beer than forty eight ounces. That's so weird, man. It's ridiculous. I'm, but apparently, a lot of people don't. They don't even realize it. Like, my yeah. buddy had no clue. He's like, wait, what? He lives there? Yeah, he lives in Montana, but he's from there. And so in his, he, he just thought that's how breweries work. No, yeah. And it, <laughs> it, took, it took me explaining to him, like, that's not, that's not normal, man. Right. And then I, I told him a little bit, and he's like, oh, well, I'll have to go back and see. Like, he still didn't believe me. I'm like, dude, I, I'm going to double check. I know, for sure. Well, and craft breweries have changed laws in many states. There's there's a law in Minnesota. Minnesota also has some ridiculously archaic beer laws or alcohol laws, and it's it's the Surly Law. Before Surly challenged the legislation or, or, or got a congresswoman, they got a congresswoman to back their legislation. <clears throat> you were not allowed as a brewery. You could have a brewery, but you couldn't have a tap house on site. God. You couldn't you couldn't sell your own beer right there. It'd be like having a restaurant with a kitchen and be like, "Hey, yeah, but you can't serve the cheeseburgers here." Yeah, it has you to be take delivered. them across the street. And so Surly challenged that, God bless them, and they won resoundingly. It was one of those old archaic, that just had thousand year old yeah. laws that needed to be updated. Yeah. And some wonderful congresswoman championed it, um, and they changed the law to where you know now bars or excuse me breweries can have tap houses in house. To sell and sample their beer. It's, it's called, called the, Surly. the Surly Law. That's brilliant. Yeah. Now that's marketing right there. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you can't beat that. Years and years You cannot to come. beat that. Oh, that's great, man. Oh, what did we do? Oh, we changed the laws for you. Yeah. You're welcome. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it does blow me away, though. I mean, I mean, I know there's still, there's still dry counties in places and everything like that. That still exists. Right. But, but I guess I just never thought of the fact that um, those different laws for craft breweries. And a lot of it, when you find out the reason why they're still in place, is because of other businesses not wanting to lose their money. Exactly. And it's from, um, you know, the um, the mainstream uh, beer markets. 
Yep. I mean, they got to feel threatened. Oh, like, absolutely. It's, it's, it's huge, a huge yeah. push for craft beer. And I, I don't think it's anywhere close to being oversaturated. There was some, I read a few articles a couple years ago that were talking about, you know, has the craft beer market been oversaturated? Are we, you know, hitting a, a pinnacle where it's all going to come crumbling because there's there's too many? And Right. No, not even close. I, I don't think we're anywhere near. Uh, I, think, I think we're seeing more and more of a growth. Now, I could be completely wrong. You know, because I've right. I've I've been wrong before. We all know that <laughs> about other things, but uh. but you know, at the same time, you say that because um, that's a good that's a valid ar- uh, point. Because I think it was about three or four years ago, I, and 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 at the time, I was probably paying a little bit more closer attention to the craft beer market, and I was reading some different magazines and the outlook of things, and a pretty prominent name. In, in the craft beer world, had said this. And I agreed with him 100%. And his point was, and this was back in, like I said, this was probably, we'll say 2014-ish. And his point was, it's, there's not going to be a crash, but it, it's, it's going to level out. It's got to level out. And I totally agreed mm-hmm. with him at the time. I thought, oh, absolutely. There's, just, there's too much starting all the time. Um, it's it's going to level out at some point. It's yeah. going gonna to hit a point. And it hasn't. Not yet. It hasn't. And, and here we are four, almost five years later, and it's still growing. Now, there's some breweries that have have had to scale down or close their doors, um, you know, sadly, because there's some good breweries that have just not been able to make it work. But as a whole, the, the market is still growing. Yeah, well, the same thing happened to churches back in the day. They had to settle down and close their doors. So, I mean, and then the, the ones that are worth their worth their weight stay up no kidding <laughs> just kidding but <laughs> <laughs> no it's i think um i don't know it's something where it's like when i go somewhere the first thing i look for is craft breweries absolutely what's the local flavor of this area yeah you know i mean it's and it's it's amazing to go somewhere different and Everything, like, I was in Hawaii earlier this year. Yeah. And I'm down in Hawaii, and we're at, I'm at, I went to Maui Brewing. I went to... Uh, Gray Brewery. Oh, dude, there was one. It was Co... Kona? No. Oh, well, I did have... I mean, there was a Kona Tap House, so it was, oh, sure. it was, it was Kona, but they, they brew, I think, on the Big Island. I think so. Um, they had a pineapple beer. Who did? In Hawaii. Oh, yeah. Uh, I forget the name of it, but then they also had, uh, but their their stouts and their porters were still, like you think for Hawaii, like you wouldn't want something thick and dark and everything sure. like that. You want something fruity and tropical and that, but they had, uh, uh, their still was like, holy crap. But but again, it was like, it still tasted like, yeah, I'm definitely in Hawaii. You mm. know? Um, but that's the cool thing about craft beers is it's it's all in, it's a local, it's a local flavor. And oh, absolutely. Uh, we, we, it's always funny whenever Whitney and I go somewhere. I'm like, I'm like, okay, this is our hotel we're at. Here's three breweries within five blocks. <laughs> <laughs> or here's here's where I want to go check it out. And yes, or then we went to Minneapolis to one of her uh, her um, uh, family's weddings, and uh, there's multiple great breweries in downtown Minneapolis. Too. Sure. Oh my gosh. And yeah. I walked around all the time, and just like, well, I'm gonna. They're within eight blocks of each other. So yeah. I'm going hit, to hit this one up for a bit. But they didn't do, um, like, sampler things. Um, oh, really? Yeah, you couldn't you couldn't Like, no s- samples at all? No, you could you could get a sample. Um, sorry, it was... Uh, um, God, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, like, when you... Oh, sorry, uh, uh, a flight. Flight, sorry. sure. Um, they wouldn't... They, they didn't do flights. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe all, some of them did, but uh, they were just like, no, like... You yeah. can taste whatever beer you want, but when and part of it, I think, is probably because of the bartenders, because who loves who loves making flights and oh, then, they're a pain especially in the ass. when you're busy. And oh, it's they're like, a pain oh in my the ass. god! So I'll play devil's advocate on that too. <clears throat> we actually got rid of flights at Crow Peak. You did? Yes. Oh. Because a when you're busy, they're an absolute pain in the ass. Yeah. They take so much longer, and and if you get a party of say four or five tourists. If the first guy orders a flight, every single person behind him is going to order a flight. Yeah, it does kind of domino effect. And it pushes you back. It puts you back so much. And on top of it, at the end of the day, 
If you want to properly get, a, you know, I just had this conversation today with Nick Caton at Killian's. If you want a proper taste of a beer, if you want to really get, you need pretty much eight ounces. Yeah. Not two, not four. It's one thing to get a little splash and go, okay, I'll go with that. And then you go with it, right? But if you're getting a flight, it, it's it's actually, it's a really bad way of tasting beer. It's, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't, because you've got four flavors that you're comparing to in small amounts. So if, as you go from one to the other, you forget the one before. Right. And, and, and really to get a proper taste of a beer, the body of a beer, the... The nose of a beer, uh, everything all around, the effervescence of a beer, anything, everything, the hop character, the malt character, the roastiness, what have you, you, you know, four ounces doesn't do anything. Yeah. You need almost, you need a half pint. Well, and... Like, Grow up and, and you know, order a beer like an adult. Well, it kind of became the, the expected norm, too, because I'll go into breweries that still do fights, mm-hmm. and... Um, and I'll look at something. I'm like, oh, I'll have that. I'm like, oh, do you, do you want like, you want to taste it or do you want to fight? You know, no, I'll just, I'll just get a pint. Right. Because I just know, like, even if it's something that I, if it's something I really don't like, you know, I'm gonna say something like, hey, I'm not really <laughs> digging this. But this that's is... never happened. Right. You know. It's, right. It's like the for the of... most part, you're gonna find something in that beer you like. Yeah, and even if exactly. it's something, yeah, it's you know, I don't really dig it. I'm still gonna drink it. Because yeah. it's still going to be good. Absolutely, unless you're a toddler. Yeah. You well, know, just order your damn beer. There are some toddlers out there. Oh, there are. None of them drink. <laughs> <laughs> that we know of, God, <laughs> that I That we're hope. aware of. Um, yeah, but outside of craft beer, uh, one, of the, one of the cool things I've, I've uh, learned about you is you've got a giant history in music. Um, and we've known each other for almost, a, I'd say almost a decade, if not at Gotta least be. a decade now. Gotta be, yeah. Um, and uh, I, uh, it was really neat hearing a lot of the, just the history that you've gone through and, and touring with bands. And, and part of that, I'm guessing, is from when you lived in Nashville and, and connecting with people. But I'm guessing that goes even deeper than just, hey, I was around and I, I jumped on on a in a van. You know, hopefully that's right. not how it happened. <laughs> in a random van. <laughs> What but they said they had candy. That's how it works. Um, and do you and you've so music's a definitely a big part of your life. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. I guess I just kind of want to chat a little bit about some of those stories on the band you were touring with. And uh, and by touring, you were I think you were were you the road manager or no merch guy merch guy. Okay. Yep. Okay. And this was what was the name of this band? Oh, which one? Are you talking about the Crazy Finns? Um, Yes, that's the one I'm talking about. So there's this band from Finland, right, that you were with, and they were, what was their style? Was it? Somewhere between probably power metal, fantasy metal, a little bit of death metal. Okay. Very, very heavy. Also, uh, a lot of of emphasis on the keyboards. Um, Pretty heavy, but, but but a bit melodic too. It's it had great grooves, great breakdowns, phenomenal musicianship. I mean, second to none. True brewing approved. I'm guessing. I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. 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 So let me just say to everyone out there right now, I I, I am not at all. Um, I am the farthest thing from a music um, elitist or super knowledgeable. At the end of the day, sure, you know, and this is nothing against my upbringing, but I was, I was raised very conservative Christian. So if it wasn't saying, you know, Jesus, we weren't allowed to listen to it. Well, aren't you, aren't you friends with DC Talk? I'm just kidding. Uh, It will stab you with this tag. (laughs) (laughs) But I think I've been on stage with DC Talk. Oh, there it is. Uh, There it is. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the guy from DC Talk, Toby, he's not a bad guy. His music's corny and terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I actually was living in Nashville for a while, um, for for four years, and I was going to this church, and it was I will say this: it was a good church. They had good leadership. They had they had good good men and women involved. But it was kind of a mega church, and it was kind of around the time of my awakening of 
uh, for me, I don't really think this is how it should be. I'm not sure that this much money should be spent on the band and HD cameras and broadcasting and, hey, where's the food kitchen for all the poor people? Maybe we should be doing that, perhaps. I bet that's what Jesus would do. But there were some good men there, honestly. Yeah. There were some good, good guys that, yeah. s- that, that, that did a lot for me and, and had a lot of good things they, you know, to, to tell me. And um, But Toby from DC Talk, side story, me and my buddy Jason, my roommate Jason Porter, God, yeah, I wish I could find that dude. We would sit next to Toby at church until one day, and I can't honestly tell this whole story because people just aren't going to get it, but something happened in church that made us all start laughing really hard, <sighs> really bad. So much so that G that that Jason got up and left. He had to go to the bathroom. We were laughing. We were we were starting. A, we're grown adults, and we're starting a scene in church. And Toby Mac's wife is slapping him on the leg, like she's complete, like she's abhorred at our childish behavior. We're shaking, and the pews were laughing so hard. And uh, the very next Sunday at church, Jason and I come to church, and uh, I see Toby. We we grab a pew, and I kind of look at him, and you know, I point down. Yeah, hey, yeah, dude, you want to sit with us? And he literally like looks at his wife and looks at us and, and gives me that look like, I, I'm not allowed to anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> he got in trouble. You ruined church for him, Oh, man. yeah, which to me just made it better. Oh, my gosh. But, so, That's he, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there with so much better musical taste than me. I grew up, you know, very, very sheltered, extremely sheltered. Dude, I didn't get into Led Zeppelin until I was like in my late 20s. Yeah, but do you think that kind of background, though, is what – drives people to heavier and darker tunes. For me, I could see that. Like, it did that for me. Like, I dove hard into just dark, the darker the better. Yeah. You know? Well, because we were we were sheltered from so much, and everything was wrong, and everything was bad, and everything was hear no evil, see no evil, do no evil. Yeah. And so you, you get something even remotely kind of heavy and dark, and you're like, dude, I love that. Yeah. And, and I can say, even to a certain extent... It, to a certain extent, I'm, I'm thankful for that because it caused me to dig deeper for good bands. So there was bands in the Christian music industry um, that maybe didn't belong as far as, like, the doctrine and stuff. But, like, there, there's this old thrash band called The Crucified. And to me, they're, they're as, every bit as good as Slayer. Mm. They were phenomenal. They were Christian dudes in a band. They're from North Long Beach, four white boys that grew up on a rough side of town and made thrashy, slashy music with crazy breakdowns, heavy breakdowns, and they challenged everything in the church and everything in religion mm-hmm. for what it was, for the compromising and, and, and the, the corporation junk of it. And so bands like that, that, that was a band called The Crucified, and out of that birthed another band called Stavesacre, who Stavesacre... Stavesacre right? I know it's that. written some of the most beautiful yeah. music you'll ever listen to. Big it's fan. ridiculous. And I found some good hip hop groups. I found good punk rock bands. I got, you know, there was this old band called The Lost Dogs. And they were, dude, they were, they were, they were indie music before indie music knew what it was. And they made some phenomenal music. And they may have been on a quote unquote Christian label, but they were panned and they were never giving they were never given a chance to succeed because they weren't singing this little light of mine, and they were challenging the the church structure of what mm-hmm. it you know. So again, with all that said, I, I'm not I'm not a music authoritarian at all. I, I I like a lot of music. I learn a lot. I have friends that listen to way better music than me, and we all trade ideas. But so I I yeah, when I was about gosh I think it was about twenty, I moved to Southern California on a whim. And I had a little bit of background in radio and television promotions and stuff. And so I hit up some indie labels. I hit up uh, Five Minute Walk Records out of L.A. Oh because they had, gosh. remember that, Five Iron <laughs> Frenzy? Yes. Uh, they had a few other bands, but, oh, but you know, mostly, I, I still love, I will fight anybody. I love Five Iron Frenzy. Oh, hands down. I love that band so Adore much. Adore them. Yes. Dude, uh, they're, uh, before they came back. Um, their final show that they did at the uh, at the Fillmore in Denver. Were you at that? Oh, I Ugh. was. I was, and Ugh. it was amazing. Like the whole yeah. five thousand people in a mosh pit. Yeah, and you're right in the middle of it. You're like, it, it's okay if I die right now. <laughs> right, I'm good. <laughs> like, I'm happy. I'm I'm good. But, you know, yeah, it was it was it was awesome. So yeah. I ended up getting. Um, 
a job with Rescue Records out of San Diego, which was the uh, POD. Yeah. That was their starting label. And at the time, I mean, I was head over heels in love with POD. Here's these four dudes singing rock rap, but not shitty rock rap. Yeah. Like, at least at that time, it was still a little street level. It had some aggressiveness to it. It had some some good purity to it, yeah. you know? yeah. And so I started working for them and got to know the POD guys. Well, then, long story short, I moved to Nashville. I quit that job. I got a good offer in Nashville. Right at that time, POD blows up. They get their deal with Atlantic. They release that album, you know, with um, Alive and Youth of the Nation. And, I mean, they hit it big, you know, good for them. And we're still pals. And Sonny, the lead singer, calls me at random. It was on a Monday. I was filming. uh, I was working with my good friend Greg Edmondson. And we were filming a show. Do you remember the old uh, Christian singer, uh, Brian Duncan? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. So all I can say is for the majority of Brian Duncan's music, to me, it was all terrible. But he was getting older, and it was kind of a spot where he could do whatever he wanted. So he did this little show in Nashville with and, and Brian Duncan always had a ton of soul. He was he was raised on like Mississippi blues and old R and B. Um and he gets this band that is just all these they looked like these just broken down old black men and they got on instruments and they made them scream. Mm. And it was a B three organ, bass guitar, electric guitar, drums, and these dudes just crushed it. And Brian Duncan just got up there and sang like old Negro spirituals and, and soulful, beautiful music. So I'm filming this show for a live DVD, and right beforehand, Sonny from POD calls me. He's like, hey, homie, what are you doing? And I was like, well, eh, you know, I'm just like, you know, doing a little work. He's like, no, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing with your life? And I was like, I don't know. I'm 23. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. What are you doing with your life? And he's like, we leave for tour on this Friday out of Denver. We need an extra guy. Can you come on tour? Of course. I'm like, are you kidding me? Absolutely. So I go, I do a one tour with POD selling merch. And from there, it was all, who do you know? Exactly what people say about the entertainment industry. It's all who you know. It is. And I worked with this gal, Melissa. I forget which band she worked for. Um, And that was the same year my grandfather died. So I was back here home in Spearfish. I I had my grandfather's funeral. I was working for a local guy doing some landscaping stuff and building like retaining walls. And I still remember this phone call because it was like mid-October. It was probably 15 degrees out, snow blowing, and we're building a retaining wall. The wind is blowing. It's terrible. And my friend Melissa calls me. She says, hey, there's this band out of Finland that needs a merch guy Somebody dropped the ball. They didn't hire a merch guy for their tour. They leave in a week. Are you available? And I was like, let's see. I can leave building retaining walls in South Dakota at 10 degrees and go live in rock and roll, or I can stay. Yeah, I'm good. Let's roll. I'll be right there. Book the damn ticket. (laughs) And it was this band called Children of Bodom. And I had just been turned on to this band about a year before. Like I said, pretty aggressive, a little bit of fantasy melodic, heavy on the keyboards, but still pretty heavy. And their their uh, guitar player is a, man, a guy named Alexi Laiho. And if you find a better guitar player than him at his age, I'll kiss your ass. Mm-hmm. I really? Mean, oh, dude. Jeez. At the age of 25, he appeared on the cover of Guitar World ma- magazine with Zach Wilde and Steve Vai. He was 25. Shut up. 25 years old. This dude shredded the guitar like it was nothing. You're finished. I mean, those guys over there, dude, what do you do growing up? You play instruments and drink vodka. Yeah, yeah. He was classically trained in piano, violin, and guitar. Jesus. So he'd get on stage, and, dude, he would look at fans. He'd stare them right in the eye as he's ripping the most ridiculous solo. It was effortless for him. His solos, they, they were nothing. And he would just shred this. Guitar. We'd be on tours with bands much bigger, you know, Lamb of God, Fear Factory at the time. And everybody knew who the best, who the most talented band on the tour was, and it was Children of Bodom. Their drummer, phenomenal. Their 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 rhythm guitar player was astounding. Alexi would look at him sometimes and just be like, oh, "Dude, you take the solo," and he'd just be just insane. And they also were about half out of their minds in a very good and innocent way. Yeah. Like these dudes would get on stage and scream their guts out. 
you get them off stage and they were the softest hearted, softest spoken, sweethearts. I mean, the Scandinavian people are amongst the greatest people you ever meet. They're so kind and yeah. wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I remember one night, Henka, the bass player, we were in Manhattan. Um, I think it was maybe second night of the tour. And we had a short day the next day. So tour manager, you know, he let us all go out. We're hitting up Manhattan. And the thing about um, New York is um, that a lot of people don't realize, you can't park buses in New York. Not for availability, legality. You cannot park buses. We were playing at the Roseland Ballroom, which was right next door to the Letterman Show. Oh, okay. I saw Bill Walton walking across the street that day because it was a time when uh, Letterman was uh, interviewing legends of the NBA. Nice. I wanted to go talk to him, but I was too scared, and he's a big man and whatever, and I was hungry for pizza. <laughs> and so we go out that night after the show, and we're hitting it hard, and we're hanging out at this club, and I kind of had realized, and maybe at the time, I think at the time I wasn't a heavy drinker very much, and I, ju- I wanted to stay kind of in, more in control, and I was kind of watching how everybody was acting and stuff, and... Um, it gets to a point where it's, it's in New York, last call is 4 a.m. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. Yeah. So mm. it's like three and the majority of the band and the other crew, they all want to go back to the, ho- to, to the bus, which is parked over in New Jersey. Sorry, I didn't finish that point. You can't park in New York. You got to cro- you got to uh, park your bus across the river in New Jersey at a hotel. You can't park your bus overnight in downtown Manhattan. It's illegal. Okay. Um, and so they're all getting ready to leave. And Henka, who is like the most laid back member of the band, he's the most docile. He's the little white sheep of the band. He's like, he's refusing to leave. He wants to keep hanging out. He's not being mean or, or belligerent, you know. And so our, our tour manager was a guy named George Neubert from Switzerland. And we nicknamed him Neubi. And I said, Neubi, listen, I'm sober. I'll look after Henka. I'll get him one or two more drinks and we'll make our way back. You know, let you take the rest of the guys back. You're already in charge of enough. I'll take care of Henka. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So this was an upstairs club. We walked down to the street. We get down there, and Henka realizes he left his jacket upstairs. And this was probably, I think it was November, late November, so cold enough in New York. And I literally, I pushed him up against the wall, and I said, Henka, do not move. Do not leave. I'm going to get your jacket. Don't leave. <laughs> I run upstairs. I find his jacket. I swear to you, my turnaround time was 45 seconds. I come downstairs, and there is no, Hank is nowhere to be oh, found. Oh, great. A six foot three, beautiful blonde boy roaming around Manhattan, drunk as could be, no, has no idea where he's going. <laughs> so I kind of look both ways, and instantly I'm like, oh, God. I, I don't, it's New York. It's, yeah. you, could, you couldn't pick a worse city to lose somebody. <laughs> Or to try and find somebody. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> where, where do I start? Oh, my gosh. And so I start heading down, I don't know, 53rd maybe. I don't know. And uh, I'm heading down. And I'm, I'm like running and I'm looking up and down every every alley and every, you know, intersection as I go. And I'm hoping that he's easy to, to spot because he's a tall, long-haired, blonde Scandinavian. You know, yeah. he should stand out at some point. And uh, I come across a strip club. And they're closed down. There's a there's a security guard escorting the girls to their rides to, to cabs and stuff. So I'm like, oh, man, how do I do this? You know, this already looks sketchy. I'm walking up to strippers, getting up for, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Right. And uh, I'm like, hey guys, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. You know, security guard turns around, looks at me. I said, I lost a guy. I work in music. One of our band members left the club. I'm, I said, have you seen? A tall, blonde, Scandinavian dude, very good looking, long blonde hair, probably staggering. Is there any chance you've seen him? And all of them are like, oh, dude, I'm sorry. No, we haven't. I haven't. And the security guard was like, you know, he maybe went this way towards Times Square. Check that way. You know, know, bright lights, you know, moth to the flame. And so I get to a swimmer. And I'm going all off instinct and literally just praying like, dear God, I I don't want to get knifed in New York. Yeah. I've got to find this guy. I gave the band and tour manager my word that I'd look after him. I have to find this human. So I end up at some point going north. And again, I don't I don't remember the street numbers. I don't know where I was. And I end up, sorry, that's my dog barking. They're playing. <laughs> um, Heath's dog and my dog are wrestling. Um, and so I end up back in Times Square. And there's a little hot dog stand. And I see four police officers. 
Well, what do I think? I'm from small town Spearfish, South Dakota. My granddad was the chief of police of this town. You walk up to any officer in this town and go, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for somebody. You know, I lost somebody. Dude, they're going to drive around in their car with you until you find them. Yeah. Because it's small town. That's just how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is New York. <laughs> Couldn't be more opposite. <laughs> and so I'm like, excuse me, officers. Hey. I tell them the story. I'm like, hey, I, you know, I was, I, was, I was watching after this guy. I'm, I'm, I'm working for this band. And, you know, he left. I was like, is there any chance you've seen a tall, blonde, very blonde, very white, Scandinavian dude wandering around? And they literally look at me and take a bite of their hot dog, and they're like, not nah, dead. We haven't. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, um, a little direction here, anything? And the one guy kind of steps out. He goes, if I were you, I'd head south. Uh, maybe check around 44th. He goes, my guess is you guys either getting rolled by a heechee prostitute or getting robbed by some Koreans. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and that is literally it probably... takes a bite of his hot dog oh, and says, yeah, see it, you later. And unassumed, he's not worried at all. He's like, and he literally, he smacks me on the street and goes, good luck, guy. And I was like, okay, o okay. So, wow. heechee prostitutes and Korean gang members, perhaps. Okay. Dude, I, I swear to God, and there's nothing short of it was the hand of God. I jump in a cab, and I'm like, hey, take me down this way, take me down this way. And literally, it had to be the hand of God. We get to an intersection. I look, and there's an all-night um, like convenience store. Mm -hmm. And who's in there but a tall, dopey, oh very drunken gosh. Scandinavian. And I turn to the cab, I'm like, stop the car! Stop the car! I throw it. I go, stay here, stay here, please, stay here. Whatever I have to give you, stay here. Let me get this guy. I've got to get him in the car. I walk in, and Hank is in there talking to the store owner who's Arabic, trying to trying to figure out where he's from. And uh, he's like, "What? What are you? Where are you? Are what is? What is your? What's your country, man? Oh my god!" And the guy, the the wonderful little store owner, goes, "I am from Qatar." And Henka, who's never been to Qatar, goes, Qatar, that's nice. Oh <laughs> and I walk in and I've got his winter jacket. He's been running around in New York in like 40 degree weather in jeans and a t-shirt. I walk in and Henka goes, Matt, you brought my jacket. Oh my God. That's like, get in the f cab right now I'm before I you. stab you. <laughs> So we get back to the bus. I wake up the tour manager, and he goes, oh, God, you found him. And I was like, yeah, I don't know how, but I found this dipstick wandering around downtown Manhattan, drunken as could be, and somehow, by the hand of God, I tracked him down. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I tell you what, touring with metal bands, it can be a hoot. Oh, I believe it, man. It's not good for your health. I absolutely believe it. But I would it's... imagine it's, it's on par with back in the heyday of touring with you know, like Waylon and Willie and Johnny and oh, some absolutely. of the crazy stories that go on with that, you know? Yep. When you think of, you know, good old boys versus metal bands, it's kind of the same concept. Oh, absolutely it is. How crazy can we get? When it was, I think it was about my, or maybe it was shortly after, it was about a week and a half into after touring with Children of Bodom, and we were in the back lounge of the bus, which anybody in touring life or has been one, you know, the party happens in the back lounge, you know? Yeah. That's where band members go, and, you know, we, there's no way around it. You, you eat pizza late, you drink beer, you drink whiskey, you know, you, you have a good time and you go to bed. And uh, Alexi, the lead guitarist, goes, Matt, you know, we, we love you, dude. We love you. You're, you're one of us now. And we want to we wanna make sure we're, we're going to give you the treatment to make you part of the crew. And I'm thinking, like, what in the world? Like, you know, if you're in South Central, that means you're about to get beat up and shit. <laughs> Um, and he's like, we're going to give you the Finnish headstand. And instantly I thought, there, this, there's no way this can be good. This is not going to end well. I don't well. want this. No. <laughs> I don't want this. So they, they make me stand on my head and help me balance. I'm on my head with my feet up against the door. And the point is, they take a bottle of whiskey, shove it in your mouth, turn it upside down, and you drink until whoever's holding that whiskey bottle decides you've had enough. Oh, my gosh. And if you're not drinking, you got to do it again. If they're not seeing bubbles going. Oh, my gosh. And I like whiskey. 
But nobody chugs whiskey unless you're like 22 and stupid. Yeah, that's not a... Oh, no. dude. So, uh, Janne Wehrman, the keyboardist, he shoves a bottle of Jameson in my mouth, turns it upside down, and they're cheering along, and, and I'm literally wondering if I'm going to escape with my life. I'm like, oh my God, this is so much whiskey. It's ridiculous. Well, at least it was Jameson, though. Not, yeah. Not a bad whiskey. No, exactly. And uh, then he decides to pull it out, but since he'd already been drinking... He wasn't really thoughtful when he pulled it out, so it's not like he tipped it up. He pulled it out while it was still pouring. So I had whiskey go down down my nose <laughs> and into my eyes. Oh, no. So I come up spouting and choking and crying, and they're like, right, right, you did it. And I'm like, this is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I want to go back to building walls in South Dakota. <laughs> I don't want to be here right now. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. For five days, I could smell whiskey in my nostrils because oh, it just sat good in there. Night, dude. I tell you what, it made me a lighter drinker at the time. I believe the it. The last thing I wanted to see was a damn bottle of whiskey. Next month, you're just chugging water every oh, time you see it. It was it was a sober month for sure. That's a good Holy good crap. cheer all. Speaking of speaking of drinking, should we get another beer or open this bottle here? I think we should crack into this. Let's crack it open. About once a year, I go spend some money on myself. Treat yourself. <laughs> And uh, I buy myself a nice bottle. So we're just cracking into this bottle of Oban uh, Highland Scotch Whiskey. Mm. This one is 12-year aged. It's about a $100 bottle. Oh, which, crap, dude. Well, yeah, for guys like you and me, there's other people, they drop that in a heartbeat. <laughs> this is like a once-a-year deal for me. Heath Bar getting fancy. Getting fancy up in let me get. Let's get a little bit of ice just to yeah, thin it with. Yeah, let's do it. So 12-year. 12 12-year 12 Oban. Nice, nice scotch. I would love to get to a point in life where I could, like, do this four times a year, like quarterly. Just, like, buy a nice bottle of... Yeah. ...of uh, Some good scotch, scotch or, or bourbon. Um, my go-to bourbons are, are Bullet and Maker's Mark. Oh, you can't go wrong with those. There's <sighs> nothing wrong with those. Dude, I love Bullet. Yeah. Bullet is us and Maker's Mark as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I I always have one or one or one or the other at home. Just mm-hmm. you know, whenever. And I uh, for Christmas I got uh, I bought myself one of those like uh, countertop barrels. Oh, spouts, nice. Which is cool, you know. I oh, mean, absolutely. It's, it's kind of cheesy, but That's it, that. it's you know you let it's 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 wood, so you would imagine yeah. you let it sit there long enough. Eventually, the it's going to be a. It's not going to make it worse. It's no. not going to go bad. No. It's yeah. going to be great. And then I've got a got a tray with a couple glasses and then a uh, a decanter as well. So then I've got uh, one bottle in that and the other bottle in the in the barrel. And so it's just whatever I want to do. That's it's, killer. It's the it's the beginnings of the the uh, the full Heath Bar that is yet to be built. Nah. But, you know, well, one day. Well, cheers, dude. Yeah. It's a good one. Let's taste this out. Oh God, that is wonderful. Holy crap. That is outstanding. That is smooth. I was going to say, I don't know that you could get a more well-balanced scotch than that. I think that might be the first. I know I've had Oban, but I don't believe I've ever bought one. See, scotch is one of those things for me, it's got to be, like, I can't drink cheap scotch. No, you, know, you should I don't like it. No, it, yeah, that you shouldn't know? exist. Like, this what? Uh, so they this was distilled in 1999. Yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Geez, and it. 20 years. Well, distilled, and then it said what? It says bottled in 2014. It was bottled in 2014. So it was aged 15 years. And it sat around for four years before we had cracked it open. Yeah. That is lovely. That's a trip that needs to happen. Scotland? Oh. Dude, in if, a heartbeat. If man. money wasn't an option, go do a, uh, a, dis- a distillery tour in Scotland. Holy buckets. Well, it's not, I mean, you travel all the time. I feel like you travel all the time. You try to do at least one or two trips a year to yeah. someplace new. Um, you were, now it's been a little over a year, and I, I feel like I have the shakes. The <laughs> you got the itch. I got, like, the itch bad. <laughs> um, w- w- your last trip was Prague, but before that, wasn't New Zealand before that? Or was there something between those two? Yeah, there was quite a few in between those, because Pe- Peanut and I went to New Zealand in, gosh, 2014. I wish that dude was here, because literally... I quick. I, I had to learn with Peanut that like you just don't argue with him because that just dude remembers everything. Oh, he has a stupid memory. It's ridiculous. It's fucking <laughs> photographic or some shit. 
Um, I'd be like, no, I'm not sure. And he'd be like, no, this is when we did it. I'm like, okay, let me check my, oh, that's right. You're right. We are. (laughs) That's when we did it. I'm stupid. Um, Uh, I want to say we went in like 2014. Okay. Um, that dude and I have gone to Ireland, Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, and New Zealand together. I don't think I'm missing any others. I might be because I'm dumb. Was he with you? Maybe I'm think I'm thinking of a trip you took by yourself. Or oh, we you... went to the Azor Islands together too. Okay, I'm thinking of the one because I had I had knuckles for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. No, was that he, was yeah. Was, was he that... with you? Yeah, yeah. That oh, was I what, didn't yeah. realize he was with you. I yeah. thought you were alone. No, no, no. I mean, you know, we oh, we Peter. we met in L.A. and went there. So for people that don't know, my my dog that passed away in 2016 was Knuckles, and he was a purebred American bulldog. And in his prime, he was rocking about probably 105, 110. It's the greatest dog you'll ever, ever, ever oh, find. And this, this dog was just chock full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> he loved people so much. He yeah. loved people. And even as a pup, he could be going 100 miles an hour. But, like, you know, your, your girls were young then. And when little kids would show up or, or come be around, he knew – Something in his instinct knew to just to just slow down and just yeah. take it easy and be softer on them. He was such a good dog, and he hated cats. God, he hated cats. <laughs> it wasn't like, oh, I want to chase that cat. It was, dear God, I'm going to annihilate the entire species. I will fillet <laughs> that freaking cat. So I went to New Zealand for two weeks, and at the time, Knuckles was getting a little older, so I had I had switched him over to an all red meat diet. Yeah. And I still remember because <laughs> I gave you this big Tupperware dish full of red meat. And in that, my good friend Forrest Kane, um, who owns Bunky's Barbecue here in Spearfish, yeah. which is like the greatest barbecue Same you'll ever place have. To go, man. Um, he, he had butchered some hogs, and so he saved some of the organs for me because they're so overwhelmingly healthy for the dog. And if you're already on, a, on an all red meat diet, you know, so you'd save me their hearts, their livers, their lungs. And... I mean, Knuckles, dude, if I was cutting up a liver, that dog would just be at my feet. He'd just stare at me like, I know what it is. I know what it is. I know what it is. Give it now. (laughs) And I'll let you tell the story because you fed him a full pig heart one day. Oh, my gosh. And we hadn't cut it up. No. Well, I didn't didn't (laughs) cut up. Well, you had told me, like, here's – because you gave me a little bit of – you gave me a weight scale and said he needs this, this, this much of food. I think morning and night. Yeah. Or it was like once a day, or I forget how it was now, but, um, and you said, so measure, you know, measure it out. Here's some, here's some strips and stuff like that of other stuff. I said, and you said in the pig hearts, you had like three or four of them that were Mm -hmm. in there also. And you said, those are, you can just give them one of those. You don't even have to weigh it. Just one of those is a meal. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and so, you know, I, and I varied it. So he wasn't, okay, four meals of pig hearts and then the rest. Right. I did it every now and then. But I did the pig hearts. And my, How old were your daughters oh, then? Okay, so they would have been, so this, what year was this? Had to be 2014. Okay, so. About around then. Okay, so they would have been seven and eight, six and seven, right around there. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they <laughs> love Knuckles to death. Oh, yeah. And But they, they had never seen <laughs> a dog eat anything other than, you know, dog food that you get at right. a store. So. <laughs> So I, I have all the food and I'm like, what's that? I'm like, well, this is Knuckles' food, and they're like, that, that looks like you know our food, like steaks and everything. Like that. Yeah. Like, well, it's as in, so I explain to him what it is, and Knuckles needs to eat these because it was his health at the time and everything like that. And I said, and this is a this is a pig heart. It's a this is you know a heart from a pig, and they're like, oh wow, and they thought that was <laughs> That's really big. It's super cool. And I mean, this is what we're gonna feed him. And He's going to eat the pig heart? <laughs> I was like, yeah, watch. And I put it in the bowl. And no sooner had it hit the bowl that it is in his, halfway in his mouth. Oh, yeah. Halfway out of his mouth. Just, ow, 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 just and half, it's just flapping oh, outside his mouth. And my daughter's sitting there going, <laughs> like, oh, my God, he's eating it. <laughs> just mortified. Beautiful, but to this day, dude, they uh, they'll never they'll never forget that. Yeah, I remember watching Knuckles just devour that those pig hearts. <laughs> yeah, now they're middle school age and older, and it's funny hearing their own stories and memories of it. No, because it's yeah. like they've had years to think through it and grow up a bit and be able to articulate themselves a bit more. But they're like, yeah, it was just just 
because he'd drop it every now and then. Of course, yeah. and it's in the kitchen floor, just blood everywhere. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? And he's licking up the blood. Oh, he's yeah. You didn't have to mop after him. No, he's gonna clean up every ounce. Yeah. Man. Also, side note, Holy how crap. how good of a friend does it take to not only watch your dog, but then be like, uh, by the way, he's on an all red meat diet. <laughs> You've got to weigh out a pound and a half of red meat for him. <laughs> Every meal. And, and some pig, you know, in entrails and such. And be like, oh, okay, dude. You know, it's not like just giving him a bowl of food. Like, it, it takes a little extra. For two weeks. Yeah. I'm gone for two weeks. I'm Here gone for go. two weeks. Thanks. I think this is enough. If you run out of food, call Forrest. Yeah, right. <laughs> call Forrest. He'll, sh- he'll shoot a cow for you. <laughs> oh, my God, though, man. But. Those were good times. Oh, those were those good great years. times. Well, and well, he's, he was a great dog. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was fun having him, and, and and that was. So I watched him once for you before I got Gibson. Yeah, my dog. Yeah. And it was part of that was why I decided I was like, yeah, I I need a dog. I'm at the time it was 29, you know, single, you know, raising two girls, and I was like, I. I need a dog. Yeah. I, had, I had no dating prospects anywhere down the line. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, it was because of that. And I, I got Gibson mm-hmm. the day before I turned 30. Oh, wow. I didn't know that was the, the mark. Best decision of my 20s, man. <laughs> yes, by far. <laughs> and I don't regret it. Here, he's going to be six this year, dude. Wow. It's crazy. And let me just crazy. say, in 2016, uh, Knuckles died. It was May of 2016. Yeah. God, and two years already, almost. Almost three, two and a half. It'll be three years God, this 29. May. Holy crap. Yeah. And. Wow. This dog was my shadow. I mean, he was my everything. And it was a Saturday afternoon. I remember I was going to go run errands. It was three in the afternoon. I mean, I remember it so, oh, yeah. so much. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I opened the door. I said, hey, bud, let's go. He was laying in the backyard sleeping. And I turn to grab my keys and I turn and he hasn't moved. And instantly I'm like, oh, this dog's old, but he doesn't, he's not hard of hearing. Mm-hmm. He's got good hearing. He's got good senses. And I said, bud, let's go. And he didn't move. And I walked halfway across my deck and my heart just sunk to my guts. Yeah. Because I knew, like, like your heart won't accept it. Your brain knows it, but your heart refuses to yeah. accept it. Yeah. And he was in the tall grass. It was a sunny, warm day. He was stretched out. I mean, he couldn't be more stretched out. He <laughs> could have been more relaxed. Yeah. His eyes were shut tight. You know, flies were all around him. And 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 I realized that that he was he was gone. And I, I mean, I've, it, I told a friend weeks afterwards. I said, in a way, I feel bad because. You know, my dad died when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I had friends growing up that committed suicide. My grandparents died when I was young. Mm-hmm. I've never mourned so hard as when I mourned over that dog. Like, I, it hurt. Yeah. It hurt crying over that dog. He was my shadow for nine and a half years. He was my everything. I, I had other dogs come after me, and that dog put them in the dirt. And if I wouldn't have pulled them back, he would have killed them. Yeah. He would have killed them. Yeah. That dog would have done anything for me. And the day it happened, my next door neighbor, Eric, he, he knew about it. And uh, my friend Steph came and picked up Knuckles because she worked, worked for uh, a vet at the time. She, you know, we can store the body for you until he's ready to be. Um, what's the word? Cremated? Cremated. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, I said, okay, you know, and, and I'm blubbering. I'm a mess. And, yeah. and, and Eric says, hey. You know, we, we get through it all, and, and then he goes, I'm going to give you an hour and a half to compose yourself, and we're going to come get you. You've got to come. You've got to get something to eat. Mm-hmm. You've got to get out. It's not going to work for you to just blubber yeah. and be left yeah, yeah. alone. And then the very next day, and I'm not kidding you, it was a, probably a, a solid three, four days where my diet was nothing but bullet rye whiskey. And tears. Tears and naps, dude, yeah. and I would just fall asleep, crying. Yeah. Just, I, I cried so hard, I thought I was gonna throw up. I, I, it was like dry heaving. My, my, it was the best ab workout I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And I remember on Sunday, the day after he died. I don't know if you remember this, but I was asleep on my couch upstairs, 
and I'd fallen asleep sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And I woke up, and you were sitting in a chair across from me, and Whitney, your now wife, was rubbing my shoulders, waking me up, and she's like, Matt, hey, buddy, hey, Mm -hmm. wake up, hey, we're here, we love you, we love you. And she had gone through her phone and found some videos and pictures of Knuckles, saved them to an external hard drive to bring to me. And you guys, same thing. You d- you drug me out of the house, and you said, we're walking to Killian's. We're going to get a burger. Yeah. You can't subside off whiskey and naps, bourbon and naps. <laughs> You've got to go get something to eat. And, I mean, times like that just shine so brightly in a friendship. Yeah, I mean, yeah. dude, that was that was as low as I've ever been. That, that hurt as bad as anything. And... You know, you find out the people who care for you and love for you, you know, Eric and Andrea, my neighbors, and you and Wit, who came over, woke me up, and were like, hey, you need to go get something to eat. Mm-hmm. We know you haven't eaten anything today. Yeah. And it's time to go get something in your system. You can't just sit here and lay on the couch well, and crying. as mad as you are at the time, because, I mean, there's a part of you that wants to wallow. I oh, mean, yeah. You know, I, I've had, uh, you know, I haven't had any... Any, luckily, I haven't had anyone crazy close to me pass away other than um, my grandfather. Mm-hmm. But this was, I was young, you know, years ago. Sure. You know? So, but it's like, you know, I, I still have all of my family. I still have all of everything like that. But it's, I dread it. You know, oh, absolutely. I dread it. Like, I don't, absolutely. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. But yeah. when you have people that will do for you what you can't in those moments, yeah, dude, it's priceless. Yeah, you can't you can't buy that. You can't no. buy that. Well, and, and you you've known Whitney since she was what sixteen. Yeah, so she had footage and stuff of Knuckles from oh, before from I years knew back. Her. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. She, you know, she grew up. I mean, she kind of grew up with him too. You yeah, know, when you think about it. But yeah, I remember meeting that girl in high school. And for the most part, when you're an adult male, when you when you meet girls in high school, you're like, eh, yeah, I don't know how appropriate this is. I don't know, you know. You're annoying. Yeah, Go away. Right. I don't even <laughs> want to talk to you. Um, no, I don't want to see your seven thousand selfies. Right. Go away. And but that's not her. So thank no, God. That's, she is that's kind of why I married her. Though one of the greatest human beings ever. And like, I mean, dude, when she was sixteen, it was like having a conversation with a twenty-eight year old. Yeah, yeah. Extremely mature, and and it just showed in that moment that she had saved pictures and videos of my dog. Yep. And she was so caring and so concerned about me. And I mean, it just you, you can't beat that. I mean, well, we were on our way to. I had a gig when you when you let us know. Oh, uh, no hey, kidding. Knuckles just, I was on my way to Minor Brewing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Because I messaged you Saturday night. Yep. Because that's like, afternoon. Yeah. And um, I think it was, sh- if not right or shortly after it happened, I said, hey, because uh, you were going to come. Dude, I just I was going to go to that gig. Come to yeah. That gig. God, I just remember that. And um, then you said, uh, you know, I can't make it. And you told, you know, obviously you told us why and everything. And um, she spent the trip, the gig, and most of the next morning, hunting down stuff of Knuckles to well, show you. I believe when it. we came over, that's yeah. just what she did. I'm up there playing music, and she's on her phone getting all that stuff, you know, in yeah. a folder to show you. And it's like, <sighs> side yeah. note: when 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 Heath Johnson um, talked to me three years ago, four years ago. No, we've been oh uh, we've been together uh, five. It was twenty. No kidding. Wow. Jeez. Um, 2014, 2015. God, it might have been four. I think, yeah. Four or five. But I remember it was in the fall. Yeah, it was 2014 because it was right after me and mom bought the cabin, the old family cabin. That's right. So and that was my first time taking you up there. That's right, yeah. And yeah. Heath was very concerned about dating Whitney because of the age <laughs> difference. And, you know, there was some friends relationships in and out of that. And and we talked about it all, and like he said, I've known Whitney since she was 16, and what it boiled down to, and I married Heath and Whitney, and I said this at the altar, I, I told the story, and I told Heath, I said, if you don't at least try <laughs> to date this girl, yeah. I will never forgive you. Yeah, I will hold it against you for the rest of your life. I will go to my grave holding a grudge. I will hold this against you for the rest of your life because that's how wonderful... That woman is, she's yeah. 1%. Yeah. 
of the world, 1%. She's phenomenal. Well, and that's, but again, that's, I mean, for me, I mean, like I said, I've known you almost 10 years, over 10 years now, I think, if I really get yeah, down yeah. into it. And uh, when you know someone that long and you find out what kind of quality of person they are, like, you, you, you value opinions and you value things like that. And that's why you go to them for advice. Sure. And that's why you ask them to perform your wedding. Um, <laughs> yeah. At Red Rocks. I'm Which was amazing. That. Red Rocks, Colorado. It was great. Yep. It was great. But, uh, yeah, dude. Um, it's been good. It's been a good 10 years, man. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I we wouldn't... didn't even talk about, I think, not even close to all the different stories oh, yeah. that I want to talk with you about again. I we're... think between you and me, we could do three or four more episodes you're, easily. You'll be on again. That, that's the, that I'm trying to get that through a lot of people's head is, is you can be on more than once. Right. You know, like, this is a ongoing show. That... Oh, I love attention. I'll be on plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Melanson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> attention whore. Oh, my God. That's good. But, yeah. Um, and so you're you're currently working at, at Crow Peak as their sales rep? Beer rep, yep. I okay. work. That's my, that's my full-time gig. I'm the yeah. beer rep for Crow Peak. So... I, I travel all across the state of South Dakota and pretty much the upper, the northern half of Wyoming, and I promote and I market and I do events and I just try to push our beer and try to remind people that we're here and what we're doing. I believe deeply in our company. I, I think the beers that Jeff brews is honestly, and this is not playing home team, I believe his beers are every bit as good as anybody's beers out there. Oh, yeah, hands um, down. He, he creates phenomenal beers. Well, he made the Heath Chocolate Johnson beer. Well, how so, do you go wrong? I mean, that's, kidding me? It's named after you. you and it beer had, named after It you. had Heath Bar and Cocoa Nips in it. What's, are you so, kidding me? Dude, it was good. It was it good. It was so good. It was fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I do. I travel. I, I mean, dude, you talk about you talk about a dream gig. My job is to visit restaurants and and bars and talk about beer and just pretty much have a good time. Nobody's nobody's angry to see you. Right. Nobody's like, ah, oh, that son of a bitch. The beer guy's here. Damn it! I don't want to. <laughs> oh, what does he have? Free samples? Get him out of here. Oh my god. You know, I mean, I have a good gig and they pay me to do it and then I enjoy it and and all I want to do is build this brand of this tiny little brewery in South Dakota that, you know, it is doing things right. Yeah. And we support all the other breweries. We've helped out almost all of them, and we're happy to do so. And we just want to build the craft, and we want to make Spearfish a destination spot. We want to put South Dakota on the map to a certain degree. We also don't want you to move here. Stay away. <laughs> keep it small. You know, don't ruin we it. We like the way it is. Come visit. Don't turn this into we'll Bozeman home. or for Fort Collins. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, and I, I uh, Jeff was on for an episode. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah. Quite a, quite a while ago. I'll have mm-hmm. to find out what episode it was. But uh, um, we were talking, um, Crow Peak Brewery is really the first only brewery in South Dakota. Exactly. I mean, you had you had Firehouse, but that's also a restaurant. Yep, you know, yep. and a winery. And we were the first. We were the first brewery to have production to be sending out kegs and cans since the 1940s in this state. In South Dakota, yeah, since the 1940s. Since Prohibition. Oh my gosh, yeah. man! You guys need to make like a do like a I don't know like a Prohibition party or something. Like Absolutely. That. You know, in a year it'll be the Roaring Twenties. Right. Dude. We need to do a Roaring Twenties beer. Oh, my God. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Zoot suits out, zoot suited out with, mm-hmm. with fedoras and Tommy guns. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, we're just, it's for all the, all the conservatives that like the open carry and you carry your, like, your pistols and stuff, we're going to take it up a notch and we're just going to walk around town with Tommy guns. Oh, my God. Like, gosh. I'm sorry. I thought this was America. <laughs> Dude, I wanted to ask you before we go, um... I was I was reading uh, was it yesterday or this morning? No, it was this morning. Uh, a lot of because uh, we're currently in a government shutdown, right? A lot of craft beer mm-hmm. can't get approvals for their labels exactly. and their designs for cans and bottles. Yep, and and so all of a sudden they they can't sell their beer. No, they can't do anything. Can't introduce it. new products. One of, one of the things they were saying was they they have to. Uh, so I don't, I don't know why they would have to do this, but they're having to dump it. Do you know why anyone would have to dump a beer because they can't label it? 
Maybe someone was just trying to get a pity. That seems a bit much to like, me. Can't you just store it? Yeah, I mean, if if you have fermenter space, you should be able to store it for, I mean, a significant amount of time. I mean, time. maybe it's smaller breweries that don't. It could be. You know? Could be. And I will tell people this. I mean, you know, we, we, we stayed away from political stuff on this for the most part, which is good. But if you look at, we talked earlier about the tariffs. We had two seasonal beers, our 605 Harvest Ale. Mm-hmm. And our Rush Enforcer Ale, which is the official beer of the Rapid City Rush, our uh, ECHL Dude, I, professional I, hockey team out of Rapid City, mm-hmm. we were able to put all. We were able to brew those batches and put them out in kegs. We were unable to can them because of the tariffs on Chinese aluminum, because of Trump's tariffs on Chinese aluminum. So, what you believe in or what you don't realize. That those tariffs, it's not just a national, big national thing. It's not just the people out in Pennsylvania, the, the aluminum factories. It's right here. It's right here in a town of 12,000 people. We missed sales opportunities. A small business suffered because of those tariffs. Will that be good in the long run? Maybe. It might be. I, I would love more American-made um, products. But for right now, it's hurting American businesses. So we were unable to put out Two beers that we would usually release in six pack cans, we were able to unable to do that because the aluminum was not available because of the tariffs. So that really sucks. And then now with the government shutdown, if we were to release, what a lot of people don't realize is what beer is held to the same standard as food. It's under the Food and Drug Administration. Mm-hmm. So if you want to release a new beer, especially if you're going to um, distribute it, you have to have labels and recipes. Everything has to be okayed by the FDA. So you can send that in right now, but since there's a government shutdown, there's a backlog. Yeah. So if we put out a new beer tomorrow and we want to distribute that in the cans, A, who knows if we're going to get the cans because of the, the tariffs, B... It can't get okayed, and that's a good part of the government. Beer, you know, I mean, it's 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 a production, you know, uh, beer. It right. needs to be okayed by the FDA to right. make sure that everything's kosher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But if that component of the government is not working, guess what? Small business suffers. Yeah. So there's money being lost in this country, and it's not just on a big national scale. It's your guys at your local brewery. It's your guys at local places. It's small town. It hits us. In American pockets. It hits American pockets. It's not hitting Chinese pockets. Mm -hmm. It's hitting our pockets. Yeah. I'm I'm curious to see where all this this plays out. But we'll see. But, you know, follow on, blind sheep. The longest one was 21 21 days. When was was, that? That was uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. And the GOP back, back in the day. 21 days. Maybe I think the longest ever, or at least the longest in in modern okay. history, or anything like that. But yeah, uh, I don't know that. For we're sure. at I think eighteen or nineteen days right yeah. now. So we're <laughs> we're right up to it with no signs of budging, no end in sight, man. We're all over a wall that's not going to make any difference. Well, the great thing about um, I guess not great thing, but one of the things that a government shutdown doesn't prevent is. Uh, <laughs> Single malt whiskey in your basement. Yeah, damn straight. <laughs> Chatting it up. It's a good time, man. <laughs> you can't stop Come this. Come and get us. <laughs> this is the Rebellion Radio Hour. <laughs> the Heath Bar is open for business, ladies and gentlemen. Damn straight. Oh, uh, well, dude, this was great. I really appreciate you doing this. We'll, we'll definitely. You'll be on again. We'll, oh, absolutely. We got so many more stories to talk about and share. And Tons. And, and talk and I'm glad I could do it. We've been trying to do this for like six months. Oh, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. schedules. I'm very happy to do it. This is awesome. Schedules is how it works, man. I think my basement bar just needs to be the new uh, headquarters for the Heath Bar. We could all, do it. All the podcasts. We could absolutely do it. Yeah, it's a great setting. I'm gonna get some photos of it. We'll spread it around and have people vote. Should this be the Heath Bar? Sure. Yes or no? Until the real one gets built, the new one gets built. Yeah. I can get a I can get a banner built, get a banner and just hang it up. It's the Heath Bar. Oh, absolutely! I have a sticker for you. I have Heath Bar stickers. I'll give you one. Okay, right. I'll put it on my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, man! <laughs> this is great. 
Man, that was a fun time. Thank you all very much for tuning into the Heath Bar for this week's episode. If you'd like to get a hold of me at any point of your day, go ahead and shoot me an email, heath at heathbaronline.com. And as always, you can hunt me down socially on Facebook and Instagram at Heath Bar Online or on Twitter at Heath Johnson. And once again, I just want to remind you all, if you are interested in helping keep this going, uh, you can donate at heathbaronline.com. Just go to that website, click on the donate button, and throw in what you can to keep this uh, happening and learning about all the cool people around our area. Uh, We'll see you all next time.